So without uh, further delay, uh, let's uh, get uh, started. Okay. Uh, first of, of all, uh, uh, a bit uh, introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Haile Fu. Uh, I work for NME and I'm based in uh, Shanghai. Um, so I have, uh, I'm working for, uh, you know, the conformal coding projects. Um, at uh, NME, we have uh, test developments on the conformal coding evaluation. Um, so, uh, uh, we organize uh, several webinars. Uh, for, it's uh, proposed by the NME Board Assembly Technical um, Integration Team. Um, uh, because of the some of the topics um, people are interested and um, there we see there is a need um, for the industry to have a better understanding um, and uh, to address some issues and potentially we may identify some topics uh, to uh, consider for the future project. Uh, that's the purpose on um, um, the, the uh, technical topic uh, series that you, you see um, in within enemy besides the board assembly area we also have uh, for instance on the 5g in the packaging area or the uh, recently also on the uh, environmental area echo design so um, if you are interested you can um, follow enemy through linkedin or uh, through our websites uh, about the events uh, Canada. Okay. Um, so for today's uh, webinar, um, we will have uh, Freddie uh, Gilbert um, from Nestron to talk about the causes and the uh, cure, uh, cures of delamination, cracks and the blisters in the conformal coating layers. Um, uh, very briefly introduce uh, uh, Freddy. Uh, he ha has a, a background of material uh, science and engineering by education. Um, he's now working for Destron um, in the reliability and the service uh, team. Um, he's the, the uh, technology analyst and um, conducts uh, technology coding, coaching, uh, coachings. Um, on the feeder analysis, surface uh, analysis, and uh, uh, risk assessments uh, in the areas of uh, electronic control units and the conformal coating. Okay, so uh, for today's webinar, we will share the presentation material, um, and uh, uh, we will have ready to give his talk. Uh, probably it will take uh, 40 to 50 minutes. Then we will leave some time for the uh, question and answers. Um, and please uh, keep your uh, microphone uh, muted um, towards the Q&A session. If you have any questions or remarks, you can use the chat function uh, to input your uh, question or comments. Uh, we will uh, go through that uh, at the beginning of the Q&A. Okay. And uh, during the Q&A, uh, you also can unmute yourself uh, to speak out. Uh, we, we can have some discussion. OK, uh, with that, uh, um, I will pass to Freddie to start his uh, uh, sharing for today. Thank you very much, Haley, for this presentation and introduction. Um, as, uh, my, my name is Freddie Gilbert. I am located in Ingolstadt, Germany and uh, we'll introduce you to one interesting topic today uh, on coformal coating problems such as chiasm of delamination cracks and blisters uh, here it how is it going to go after a short introduction of cestron i will present the different type of failures or uh, defects we can find in coformal coating layers after that, we will review the test that you can perform to evaluate uh, the situation of your assemblies before coating, but also present a few tests that can be done after application of the coating layer to check the quality. So, uh, to start, Zestron is known worldwide uh, for its um, cleaning application. Cestron is a provider of cleaning chemistry across the globe with um, headquarters in Germany and also uh, 
sister companies in America as well as in Asia. Uh, there we provide so the cleaning chemistry, but as well uh, all that is going around the cleaning uh, cleaning processes, so process monitoring possibilities for you, um, cleaning process, as well as technical support for the development of your technical uh, cleaning process, or also the support should you have any problem after that. In addition to this, uh, we are providing in Europe and in China uh, we have a reliability and surface. Um, department which is uh, responsible for uh, analyzing electronic assemblies and give interpretation in case of failures or for risk assessment on your new product uh, regarding um, sensibility to humidity related uh, failure mechanism for example. So there we are uh, usually focusing on one topic, uh, your topic if you have one on the customer side, to try to help and find the best way to uh, understand uh, a problem that can happen, but also help you find way to optimize processes or, um, or any service that can help you avoid the problem in the future. So our department uh, is can be divided in three uh, really main uh, kind of activities. As I mentioned, the reliability solutions, so the coachings where we are working on a, a dedicated problem um, that you can have like failure analysis or risk assessment. But we are also uh, active in many research uh, groups and we have partnerships all over the globe with um, well, with uh, associations or groups like the Enemy, uh, and we work together on different projects related to um, electronics and also re reliability of electronics. And uh, last but not least, we also have an academy which is here really uh, dedicated to the trainings and workshops when we are usually in contact with customers to train them in a specific topic and area uh, to answer the specific needs in terms of um, knowledge regarding electronics and first and foremost electronic reliability. So for uh, Coaching, what we do, we know we, we do surface analysis uh, on our premises here, and we also do not only deliver the results of the analysis, we uh, interpret them to give you the best combination of analytic result data and experience interpretation, so that at the end you uh, have results that you can use and uh, find, implement, as well, find implement possible implementations to solve a problem or prevent any problem in the future. We are active at different uh, parts of the lifetime of an electronic product, going from the design prototype, where we are usually assessing risks for the reliability of the product, but we also intervene during, uh, during production and uh, further processes to optimize uh, existing processing. And when failure is happening on the field, uh, analyze this, uh, the failures with different kind of methods to uh, retrieve the source and the root cause of the problem when possible. So I really, we are really well uh, broadband uh, implemented to analyze specifically uh, one project you might have regarding reliability of electronics. So that was the short introduction of Cestron. Let's focus now on the main topic of today and conformal coating. As uh, maybe I thought it was interesting first to go back on the reasons why we are um, considering uh, conformal coating in the first place. As you know, electronic assemblies uh, are now everywhere and even more electronic even more electronics is coming in products that we usually use every day such as cars planes and also different devices in home uh, um yeah home equipments and uh, due to that reason as we find them everywhere electronic assemblies are also um confronted to different kinds of stress, such as temperature variation, or also vibration, acceleration, crash in case of uh, transportation, but also more um, tricky, I would say, environment, who can be corrosive uh, with um, humidity or salts or salt spray and harmful gases, which might trigger corrosion and uh, destroy the assembly or at least uh, cause some problems or issues to, for the functionality of the end product. 
Also here we have sometimes electrical issues due to the process itself. Uh, when flux residues in too big amounts are staying on the assemblies or impurities that are in the end causing stress and failure of assembly. So usually what we can do, one method to avoid this problem, especially when it comes to uh, moisture related failures, is to uh, put a coformal coating on the surface of the assembly. So that way you are protecting the assembly with a thin layer of polymer usually, um, and that way the polymer is like a barrier which protects uh, the assembly against any contact with liquids or uh, gases so that the functionality of your assembly is not um, compromised. The main three uh, moisture induced failures that we find in current electro electronic control units are creeping currents, electrochemical migration and corrosion. And in some cases, if your uh, circuitry is working in high frequency, signal distortion. So uh, as you see, Conformal coating can be an interesting solution to prevent uh, problems, these problems, but of course we have to respect and pay attention to a few things in order to avoid problem. One of them, as we mentioned here, is the cleanliness of the surface. So uh, I will come back to the point of subvertonic later, but so that you can have an idea here, I uh, choose to depict this graph, which is representing the different kind of uh, failures we usually find on conformal coating after, um, um, well, after coating. So delaminations, blisters, as well, or bubbles, and cracks. And as you can see here, we uh, depicted the amount of of test cycles so that was really um, test cycles in high humidity humidity and high temperature as, as you can see at zero we have an intact layer of conformal coating and throughout time we have an increase of uh, overall the amount of failures um, in the uh, in the in the in the coating layer so here i only want to say that um, the conformal coating is something which is not staying, I would say, or which is under um, really harsh condition is going to, uh, to change eventually and the properties are going to be uh, changed and maybe uh, becoming a bit more, less protect, as well, less, uh, less good. And in order to avoid these problems at the beginning, we should consider really um, pay attention to the lot of things, especially regarding the, the state of the surface, so that we avoid this problem to happen at really um, low, um, at low numbers of cycle. So uh, we should always consider that we have to have a perfect uh, surface clean state uh, before coating to avoid uh, also problems with um, with with a conformal coating that which may problem cause problem after well after that so cleanliness of the surface is one point but also the processing and the coating application is other ones another problem i would just uh, mention it also a bit later but last i would like to focus maybe on the different type of uh, defects you may find in a conformal coating layer and maybe go back to the possible root cause of these problems so we will start here with delaminations. So delamination uh, can be understood as a lack of adhesion of a conformal coating on the surface of the component or on the electronic assembly. So it is recognizable quite easily with an optical microscope. When you see this light areas, um, light areas here um, on dedicated on allocated uh, areas of your assembly. Um, potential cause for that can be uh, multiple here. So I try to uh, list a few of them which are coming really often when uh, we see the problem of determinations. The first one is contamination of the surface prior to coating. Uh, contamination will reduce the addition locally of the coating material on the surface as uh, on the surface of electronic assembly and therefore we might uh, have a uh, a problem 
But also uh, other problems that are known for causing delaminations are a too thick coating layer and uh, insufficient curing. As a too thick here means that we have a material that is so thick that we have different properties at the top of the coating layer and at the bottom. And usually it is so that at the top, the uh, coating is cured perfectly fine, but not on the bottom layers. So the bottom layers are maybe not cured properly, and therefore uh, they are not uh, coming to adhere to the surface as well as they should be. So usually a way to avoid this problem is to reduce the thickness of the coating layer to um, to have the most homogeneous properties of your cutting layer. Um, well, usually it is quite hard to say since there are many different types of materials used for cutting layer, but I'm speaking here, um, yeah, usually I would say a layer between 20 to 50 micrometers maybe as a uh, orientation value in terms of thickness is usually what we see on the market. So here maybe to illustrate a little bit further the fact of contamination. The contamination here is basically going to block the addition of the uh, molecules of the conformal coating on the surface of the assembly and uh, therefore you will have locally then uh, delaminations. This is especially visible if you are also then doing uh, test cycles in humidity and high temperature since humid humidity will also be able to to get through um, the coating layer uh, as coating is a polymer it is also permeable to water vapor and come in contact with the surface and usually when you have adhesion problems you have here uh, this is all the preferred areas when you see delaminations forming when you have um, when you have uh, problems, it's usually where you have contaminants. If we are now considering uh, the problem of cracks, so crack is usually something that can appear uh, later uh, in the uh, lifetime of a coated product. So usually it's not something we see directly after uh, application of the conformal coating. Uh, it's usually something that we see after successive amounts of thermal stress uh, with or without humidity. So you can see here, it's really like such cracks that are really uh, opening some uh, pores directly to the metallization, which is a bad thing since here, the open cracks will be an entry gate for uh, humidity and in contact with metal might trigger problems um, such as yeah, corrosion or also creepage current or electrochemical migration. So this is something also you can see quite easily with an optical microscope if your um, coating material is um, transparent you have uh, you should you have maybe have to use a other methods if you have a colored um, cutting material, but in principle it's the same. You can see them with ultrasonic microscope, for example, quite good. So here, potential cause to that are also a too thick um, coating layer. Here, uh, this results in the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that we have uh, heterogen uh, so different mechanical properties between the upper uh, coating layer and the bottom layer, meaning here that we have maybe also different uh, behaviors, uh, dilatation behaviors of the coating um, of the coating during st thermal stress. Also here, the contamination plays an important role since a very different coefficient, as well with a contamination with a very different uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, such as uh, rosine. Uh, residues will be able to uh, facilitate the formation of cracks because you have a material which is really brittle mechanically and uh, usually the coating material is a bit more um, able to expand itself without cracking but since we have a different uh, contact a different behavior mechanical behavior between these two material this uh, interface is usually causing problems um, in the coating layer. So this is also why in most cases uh, it is recommended to uh, clean before coating to avoid this kind of problems with uh, resin residues. 
or at least in no clean approaches to reduce as much as possible the amount of uh, residues from the solder process to avoid such problems. But also one cause that can be also coming quite early is that the uh, coating material is not suited for the application and become too brittle through successive thermal stress. And in that case, another kind of material should be used for the application you are considering. So yeah, here, this is the illustration, how it looks, uh, especially on solder joints. So you have maybe right after uh, the coating application, really a closed area, which is perfectly fine. And you will see after, um, after stress that these cracks are going to come through an application as we can see here and uh, create locally cracks and entry ways for water or any um, harmful gases and might trigger problems after that. And if we are now considering the problem of blisters, uh, blisters, it's maybe a bit more tricky to handle because it can have uh, different uh, different causes or a combination of causes. Uh, usually, this is something which is more process related, so really related to the cutting process itself, rather than. Um, uh, rather than the surface, but the surface can also play a role. So let me explain. Here, uh, blisters can be the result of the um, evaporation of moisture, if you are drying, for example, from residual solvent from flux that you had from your solder process. So in that case, the cause of blister is again contamination uh, of the surface prior to conformal coating. But as you can see, if we are considering the two th uh, th second and third point, the drying, so the drying step of the conformal coating and the entrapment of air on the component is more related to the coating, itself, coating process itself. When the drying is performed too quickly, especially uh, for uh, conformal coating, it is possible that we have still a few bubble air bubbles which are remaining after spraying the conformal coating and didn't not have the time to go back to the surface to be released uh, from the coating material. So if we are drying too quickly, we are closing completely the upper layer of the conformal coating and the uh, the gas which was migrating from the bottom to the upper side of the coating uh, layer will stay imprisoned in the coating uh, layer. The third point is maybe more related to the way how you are spraying or applicating your conformal coating on the assembly. Some components are uh, usually um, have a complicated geometry. Sometimes this is really uh, that way. And in the way you are applicating sometimes on some components, the coating, you might be, uh, a, you might close completely the area uh, under the, um, the component. Meaning here that you are closing the um, completely hermetically for gas, the area around the, the component and the air under the component is not released for the outside. So meaning here that it is also a problem of blisters because you can have maybe afterwards see around the component some issues in terms of bubbles or even the laminations. One way to avoid this problem would be to start to uh, applicate or spray the coating on one side so that the coating is spreading under the component smoothly and therefore pushing the air outside from the other side. So really uh, not cover uh, all the component at one time, but starting with one side and then uh, going to with uh, going afterwards from the other side, going to the other side. So that way you are able to uh, release the air which is entrapped under the component. So this is usually something that can happen for a uh, really component with a complicated geometry or big components like big OFP components, for example. But also I've listed the laminations, cracks and blisters, but you can also have other problems uh, in terms of uh, in terms of conformal coating. I, here I depicted a few um, 
I would say a few examples that can also be related to the um, to the to the three we presented before. For example, if we are considering electrochemical migration here, um, if you have any delamination or uh, cracks in your conformal coating, you will have no longer any good protection against humidity protect, uh, humidity penetration through the conformal coating. Meaning here, if you have an area which is quite uh, fragile, so we, with two different potentials, for example, and the presence of liquid water uh, through uh, condensation um, on the surface of the assembly, you, these cracks can be, or this delamination can be the uh, starting point for the formation of dendrites, also also known as electrical migration. If we are also then considering delamination occurring issues, um, sometimes the problem is so bad of delamination that it can really alter the uh, even the functionality of your uh, component or your product. So here I have the example of an LED component, so really an optical device, and the delamination of the silicon lens is triggering then uh, quality issues then cannot and the product cannot be used in the end for its application since it's changing too much from uh, what we expect in terms of quality. And a third point of problem, delamination occurring issues of a two group polyurethane coating. Also this problem can be caused when you have a contamination on your assembly uh, prior to conformal coating. As this material are uh, two components, one component can um, react preferably with the contamination itself than the other component, that other conformal coating. Meaning here that you have side reactions on your um, in the coating, and therefore you don't have a, a smooth expected conformal coating layer, which will not have the uh, properties that are required for your um, application. So you will not have any protection, a good protection of your uh, product in the end through conformal coating if you have this kind of delamination occurring issues induced by uh, the presence of contamination. Um, this point actually illustrates really good the um, presence of air bubbles you might have under uh, components. So I said earlier that here you might have um, air bubbles under components, and this is a typical example. So here you have all the conformal coating, which really basically was spread all around the assembly. As you can see, air remained imprisoned in this area. So all this area is not coated with uh, conformal coating. Uh, the optimal situation would have been to start from the side so that the air can move in the opposite direction to be removed and then continue to spray so that we don't have any air bubbles after that. If I'm now moving to the second picture, uh, which is uh, depicting here the uh, de-wetting during coating, uh, be aware that, for example, the presence of flux residues or uh, any contamination can um, trigger problems in terms of adhesion also of your conformal coating. Here, basically, you apply your conformal coating and you see that it's not staying on the surface but retract itself um, from on the sides. So usually it's a contamination problem, but it can also be a problem of compatibility between solder uh, mask and um, conformal coating material or solder mask quality problems. And uh, finally, also something which is maybe uh, true for some family of, um, of conformal coating materials such as silicon. Sometimes you have uh, organotin, also really organic residues from soldering, uh, tin soldering, that may cause problem in terms of cross-linking locally on solder joints. And this is something also we should avoid since Incomplete cross-linking means that we don't have a, a perfectly cured conformal coating layer uh, and therefore possibly we have pores or um, not a sufficient adhesion of the conformal coating on the surface and that should be avoided. 
So I mentioned a lot earlier the importance of having a clean surface. So yes, I, uh, I uh, can hear you. I mean, cleaning is not something which is wished or even um, wanted in the industry, but it's usually what is recommended in official documents prior to conformal coating to avoid problems. So here on this graph, I depicted the uh, total error curve of the test cycles for two different types of assemblies. One is uncleaned and the other one is cleaned. And we see very uh, here clearly that for the problems of delaminations and cracks, we have much lower failure uh, amount, of much less errors when the assembly is cleaned than uh, when the assembly is not cleaned. We see that for bubbles, we have quite similar amount of errors between uncleaned and, un uh, and cleaned assemblies. This is, as I say, mostly due to the fact that blisters or bubbles are usually induced through the coating process itself. So uh, I understand that sometimes cleaning is not an option, but I would trust them, recommend you in most cases to have the cleanest surface um, as possible to have a really, uh, really a, a no clean process, which is not leaving too much residues on your assembly um, before coating. So here is how you can check if your uh, surface is clean enough before conformal coating. So here on this slide, you find the different kind of tests you might, find, might use to help you to evaluate the uh, cleanliness state of your surface. So obviously optical cleanliness inspection is the one we should always consider to check if we don't have too much residues or at least residues on the assembly. What can be done also is uh, using a rose test or ion chromatography to assess the ionic cleanliness of the assembly. So ions here are mostly a problem since they are hygroscopic and in some cases can um, make it easier and under humidity condition, they can favorize the uh, condensation of water vapor um, in, on the surface of the assembly. As I mentioned earlier, flux and resin can be problematic, especially for cracks in terms of resin. It might be here useful to test for flux for remaining flux activators or resin residues. They are a really quick tests that are available in the market that can do that in a few minutes. Uh, Session is also providing a few of them and check if you have whether or not if you have um, flux activators or resin residues. Also testing for cross-linking disruptors, as I mentioned the fact of organotin, you also have quick chemical tests available on the market that can help you uh, check on the area if you have potential chemicals that might uh, create problem during curing of your conformal coating. And last but not least, measure the surface energy of your assembly is a good way to uh, see if you have good properties before coating. So the German Society for Corrosion Protection is usually is recommending a value of 40 millinewton per meter prior to conform conformal coating to ensure a good adhesion of, of the coating layer on the surface of the electronic assembly. Usually for that uh, measure of the surface energy, you can use um, test inks, but also uh, contact angle measurement to uh, characterize the uh, uh, surface properties. Now, if you have already um, coated your assembly and you want to check the uh, quality of your uh, conformal coating process and coating layer, many different uh, tests are available. So in case of the coating that are fluorescent, so containing fluor, you can inspect them using EDS, for example, and to check that um, thanks to this tracer, so fluor tracer, that the coating layer is closed and not, really, not leaving any uncoated area um, on the assembly or problematic area when you don't have any uh, fluorescent coating. Quick uh, test to check the addition of your cutting, it's the X-cut uh, uh, tape test or the cross-hatch tape test, where you are yeah, actually um, yeah, 
crossing the putting across on your assembly and then remove it in the, with the tape and see how much of the uh, uh, coating material you are removing on the tape and if you don't have much um, cutting on the tape it's usually a sign that your adhesion is really good your from your cutting material is really good maybe now coming to the methods that are a bit more complicated the differential thermal analysis the, or dta or also dsc can usually be used to assess the curing um, degree of your conformal coating so there you are getting access to uh, more pieces of information uh, regarding, for example, transition temperature, but also, um, but also here how cured it is, if it's uh, uncured, it also unsufficiently cured or not. It's usually some not something that we do every day because it lasts a few hours and it's quite. Um, you have to have a certain training and the equipment to do it, so it's not something which is done every day. Something which is also not done every day and maybe only once in the lifetime of the product is obviously uh, the uh, simulation test. So like with uh, harmful gas mixtures, but also life duration testing, uh, it's something usually you do one or twice to check if your product is able to withstand critical harsh conditions uh, so that uh, to, to say that it will not uh, fail or it will most likely not fail during lifetime of the product. Most probably this is a test that are really long and difficult to implement and therefore also not something you can do right after your production or uh, not every time. So the if I'm focusing now on this uh, harmful gas testing problems or overall this life testing problem, they are usually really expensive and complex to set up. Uh, you really have to have um, really uh, complex equipment, also climate chamber, test chamber, cylinders, tabs, and it's also a high effort and high cost to ensure operational safety. Because some of these gases are really not friendly to uh, material, but also not to the operator. And therefore we have to pay attention here that these gases are not coming in contact with, uh, with the air to avoid any intoxication problems or worse. And as I mentioned here, it's a long test uh, duration. We are not able to have within a few minutes a, an estimation of the quality of the conformal coating layer or porting. So this is why here uh, I will present you three tests that can come in handy when you want to have a quick assessment of the quality of uh, your conformal coating on your assembly. So it's usually tests that can be uh, carried out quickly, so from a few minutes to a few hours, so really less long than life duration tests that can actually go last days or even months, and uh, which can be done also with a minimum amount of equipment uh, and at the same time have a high, uh, high operational reliability. So also this is then something as it's going quick and not uh, asking for too much um, equipment that's things that can be done um, as part of quality monitoring tools, uh, production accompanying quality monitoring tools. So these are the three tests I would like to present now. So first is the coating reliability test, which was uh, developed and depicted in uh, from by the German uh, Society for Corrosion Protection, also known as the uh, GF Core, and then uh, go back with the quality test with iodine vapor, which would be close to uh, the corrosion gas mixture testing that I talked earlier, only a bit more simplified and safer, and uh, maybe easier to to implement. And after that, present a quick test, uh, which can be done within a few minutes, which is the cutting layer test. Let's start with the uh, coating reliability test. So here, this test is uh, something that we can use to answer the questions that are uh, here. Uh, quite simple, is a protection coating against moisture necessary for my assembly? Is the existing coating sufficient to provide protection against moisture? And so on. So here, uh, the idea is to uh, put the um, assembly in harsh condition and see what happens within a few hours. 
So it works as following. So here it is an example. You apply a voltage or a bias on your assembly and you are monitoring two things. So your assembly is then placed into, is completely emerged into um, the eye water. So really uh, emerge and we isolate the point where we connect um, electrically the assembly. And then under bias, we check what's going on when the assembly, when conformal coating is happening. So we are measuring the standby current over time to check for the presence of shortcuts or any uh, variations in the um, in the current that could uh, be translated in terms of uh, creeping currents. But we are also have a look at the surface of the assembly to check if we have the formation of dendrite growth and uh, the development of gas uh, of gas at imperfections or defects. Uh, for example, at uh, at some locations where you don't, uh, when the coating is not fully covering metal parts, you will have water getting in contact with that and um, electrolysis. So where you have then emission of uh, oxygen or hydrogen gas. So this is really maybe a harsh test, which is lasting from a few hours, I mean, from three to 10 usually. And you see after this test, if you have really uh, problems in terms of uh, leakage current or also dendritic formation. Of course, in the reality, uh, the assembly will never be or should never be put completely into water or immersed into water. So this is really the worst case scenario to check if something happens in really uh, the worst conditions. So here maybe two examples of results to illustrate a little bit the point. So we have here the um, the current which is depicted uh, over time and what we can see here from the very beginning of the test we have really quickly an increase of the current measured and also we see here the apparition of corrosion on the assembly. Uh, so here we don't have much protection uh, brought by the coating, uh, conformal coating layer uh, since uh, it's not uh, fully cross-linked. We have a lot of um, spaces in the conformal coating which uh, allow the water to get in contact with the metallization and uh, trigger these problems of corrosion and leakage current where we can see here and dendrites. Whereas here we can see that uh, even we have even after the beginning of a test, we have a relatively stable tension until approximately three hours, where we can see that we have increasing uh, currents, really here shortcuts. But we see that at the surface of the assembly, we do not have any formation of dendrites or so. So meaning here that we can say that uh, within the first three hours, we have a relatively good protection against uh, liquid water. So the coating layer is close enough to prevent uh, problems if the assembly is submitted uh, shortly to uh, liquid water on the surface. So here we can say with this cutting layer that it's resistant to short term condensation. Of course, uh, something important to say, if we um, usually the um, conformal coating layers are specified to withstand humidity or liquid water for a defined amount of time uh, from a few minutes to a few hours maximal. But usually it is that way that we can say that the protection here for a few hours is okay for our application. So if I'm now coming to the iodine vapor test, uh, this is something which is used for conformal coating, but also for potting and molding compounds. This uh, test is there to help localize cracks and penetration paths in molten potting compounds, and therefore also localizing addition weaknesses between the uh, assembly surface and molding material. This is mostly something we use with power electronics, so on DCB substrate or MS substrate to check whether or not we have a good adhesion of the molding substrate. So it is a, a further development of the pressure cooker test and uh, is using iodine, uh, which is uh, nalogen, which is also quite corrosive, but has the advantage to be really easy to handle as um, 
it can be used in a saturated aqueous solution at a temperature and then we increase the temperature is going into vapor and get in contact with our uh, conformal uh, coating or potting so uh, usually the equipment used is quite simple you have to have a beaker or autoclave with a fume cupboard which is something that we find uh, in in standard labels quite uh, quite often and uh, as i mentioned iodine will evaporate with the increase of temperature and um, when you are cooling down also coming back to room temperature iodine will come back into the solution and therefore then uh, the temperature is uh, low enough again so room temperature you can remove your assembly and then analyze it without any problems for safety of the operator uh, with this test, you have the possibility to combine uh, humidity and pressure, but uh, usually it is something that we can uh, do, but usually we're only considering here the temperature as the uh, change of um, uh, uh, doing this test. So uh, here it is how it looks like. As you can see at the bottom, we have our saturated iodine solution. When the temperature is high enough, you see this uh, uh, purple, rose, uh, pink coloration within the beaker, meaning here you have an iodine and vapor, water vapor, which is coming in contact with a DCB substrate and will uh, get in contact with the potting material. After this test, so usually this is something we do at 60 degrees Celsius for one to three hours, uh, after the iodine is cooled down again and uh, then not in the uh, atmosphere anymore, we remove the samples and then analyze them optically to check for uh, defects. So here a few examples. Um, we see before the uh, before and after test. And in that present case, we uh, looked at the silicon potting, which is quite thick as a one to 1.5 uh, centimeter layer thickness on um, DCB substrate. So before the uh, test, we have a clear transparent silicon. And after the test, we see that it's uh, becoming, uh, it's not as transparent. So meaning here, we had a, um, penetration of iodine into the um, into the potting layer and if we analyze it a bit more further we can see here a few points as you can see here locally on the copper surface uh, that are showing that we have locally small dots or small points small addition weaknesses where iodine was able iodine vapor was able to penetrate through this, um, the pores of the conformal coating. And uh, as we had addition problem, get into contact with the metal and therefore creating the formation or uh, triggering the formation of copper iodide. So in areas with insufficient putting additions, we will see uh, here the uh, copper formation of copper iodide. And it is usually something that happens in the immediate uh, vicinity of the chip solder joint. So really around, just right around the chip, uh, as a, at the, I would say, um, limits between chip and substrate material on the side. And finally, the third test I would like to present is the coating layer test, uh, which is also here in that case, a really quick test, uh, which allow us to detect uh, defects in protective coating. So here, usually it is something uh, useful if you are afraid that uh, your coating is not covering fully metallization. So that can be especially true for uh, components which are really high and you are afraid that the side of a component is not covered by the conformal coating but also to check if you don't have any major uh, pores in your conformal coating that would um, direct direct the, be in contact with the metallization so this is a quick test a chemical quick test with the liquid we apply i will come to, to this uh, how it works with a uh, with a slide later and if you have an issue with your uh, conformal coating, meaning an entry spot for uh, on your conformal coating, it will color black. So the metallization will react with the um, 
test, indica is the test indicator and create this black coloring during uh, test, which is usually happening and forming in the first seconds after application or in the first minutes. So this chemical quick test is uh, can be performed on metal surfaces which are not noble, such as tin, copper, nickel, or uh, alloys, but also uh, ferrite alloys, or also nickel, zinc uh, alloys. It will not work, for example, on precious alloys such as gold or silver, since here the um, this metallization of silver and gold are usually chemically inert. So this is how it works. For those of you who know the quick test and flux test, uh, you apply the test indicator firstly, then wait for a maximum of three minutes. And uh, after that, you uh, check optically if you have this coloration or this reaction uh, happening on the metallization. And in that case, again, say, okay, you have a defect in your conformal coating. Uh, and then you remove the uh, test indicator with um, with water, the eye water, or also with a uh, dabbing off the, from the surface. And uh, usually here, this is how it works. We have here our conformal coating. And if we have cracks, obviously we will have able to, we have to contact with the metallization afterwards. So the coating layer test is actually, um, helping you identifying maybe more easily the cracks if they are too small in the uh, conformal coating layer by uh, coloring from the metallization or reacting uh, with the metallization. And then you can see the spots I can see here where it's coming black and then uh, identify more properly the presence of cracks or entry points uh, in the conformal coating layer. So that would be the end of my uh, presentation. And I would like here to show you as a summary, a um, GF core uh, picture or graph, which was uh, used during uh, our last meetings on the conformal coating. As you can see, conformal coating is a complex process. If done properly, it can really bring a good protection against um, many kind of stresses, but you see here that you have to pay attention to uh, a certain amount of factors, such as the state of the surface, the cleanliness of the surface, the drying, uh, drying parameters of the coating, but also the geometry or the application, the way you uh, spray or applique, uh, applicate the conformal coating on the surface. And also here, uh, indirectly, uh, maybe you can see, the influence of the PCB production through the presence of contamination uh, from soldering or from previous steps during solder max application on the surface, which may be triggering problem afterwards on your coating uh, quality. So I don't want to uh, paint all is better than the other one. All of them have their advantages and their drawbacks. So really it's not related to any kind of uh, material itself. It's really general uh, presentation. And uh, it was here really to get, uh, maybe to sensibilize you to uh, problems that can happen with conformal coating, what can be their root causes and how to uh, solve uh, them. If you want to get to know more about this topic, the, here are the documents uh, that I can recommend you. Um, you can have many uh, technical articles in different papers which are uh, mentioning the topic of coating. You also have the IPC documents, especially the CC830, but also the handbook, which can help you get more into the details, uh, uh, into the well denominations and how it works with uh, coating. But also if you want to have a an over global overview of the conformal coating and understand uh, have a general com uh, so, uh, understanding of the topic. The uh, German Society for Corrosion is also uh, editing a, a handbook which, uh, around the topic of uh, conformal coating for electronic application, and you have the possibility to uh, purchase it in English or in German. I will now come to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them now. 
And before we start with the question, let me just mention the next uh, Inemi webinar, which will take place on the 8th of July uh, on the topic of PCBA clinic, which will be held by my colleague, Mr. Strixner. And should you have any questions coming in the next days or after we're watching the recording of the webinar, don't hesitate to contact me uh, per email. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Frandy. Uh, let's open the floor for questions. Uh, I see in the chat there are several questions raised. Uh, uh, one is about the presentation slides. Yes, it uh, will be available uh, and we will uh, provide a link to for you to download. Okay. Um, I think uh, we have um, the second question. Um, it's about the, okay, yeah, uh, I don't know if you Freddy, you can see the chat. Um, so, uh, I think the comments is, uh, yes, they are using conformal coatings, but usually the question is um, the suggestion of the type of resin uh, of the coating, uh, conformal coating. Which one is the best? Uh, PU, acrylic, uh, silicon, etc. And uh, I think the second question is about um, um, uh, error tested the different uh, coatings using SIR test. And uh, I think that there are detailed questions about the test condition if we use uh, um, the relative humidity chamber. Or the temperature, or con consider the corrosion defect. Okay, and even for using mixed uh, aging cycle parameters, including the salt fog, uh, acid fog test. Um, Freddie, you have any comments to this question? Uh, this is uh, from Zenzo Costa. Yes, uh, I see now the question. So my comments would be here uh, regarding the conformal material, the material of the conformal coating. Uh, it is quite difficult to provide any um, recommendation regarding that, which is really uh, depending on your budget and uh, the class of your product and uh, how the protection should be. But I can give you a few facts about that. Acrylic uh, conformal coating are really common in the industry, in the electronic industry. And uh, usually uh, the one that we store the more often. But there I will not be able to give much more information regarding the uh, choice of material, the best way would be to get in contact with a um, manufacturer from conformal coating material, maybe to get a better um, advice or uh, any pieces of advice that can help you choose the best uh, type of material. And as for uh, the different type of conformal coating, yes, here I must say, um, Usually the parameters you are mentioning, so this 85, uh, 85 degrees FG5 uh, relative humidity percent is usually the standard ones we are using and um, are really the one we are use, seeing in the industry, um, in the industry also for different various type of coating. But here to say that I have differences uh, between the type of conformal coating, here I must say I don't have any much data regarding this point. Okay, maybe I just uh, want to add, uh, we, we do have, uh, at Enemy has a project uh, developing a, a evaluation test for the conformal coatings. Uh, certainly the purpose is to develop a test, it's not to benchmark the, the, the performance and uh, give some rating. Uh, so uh, I have no suggestion at this moment for the, uh, the choices of the code, conformal coatings. Uh, but uh, I want to mention for the test uh, condition we adopt, we, we do consider uh, the humidity levels and also the uh, corrosive gases. Um, so uh, bring in from the vapor of sulfur or um, some hard uh, corrosive gases uh, using different uh, uh, test measure. 
So this is something probably you can um, uh, take a look uh, to the project uh, information from NME. Maybe uh, we can communicate later on that. Okay. So, yeah, Freddy, the, the next question is about uh, it's going to see Kaylin, uh, how to uh, define the required clinics limit. Uh, yes, here I would like to say it's also depending on the applications. Uh, if you are looking for uh, cleanliness limits, um, you may be here uh, coming back to um, to the point the uh, German Society for Corrosion Protection provided a few information regarding the general recommendation you should follow or you can follow um, prior to conformal coating to hive uh, to increase the uh, probability that everything is going well with your conformal coating. But uh, usually the way it is, I think it's the way, best way to consider your application, uh, see if you have, uh, if you require uh, conformal coating at all. And uh, also usually what is done is optically free of residues and uh, low, um, contamination values in terms of ionic contamination values. Regarding ionic contamination, uh, I would invite you to check the IPC WB19, uh, which is uh, giving you the uh, maybe more information or more insight how you can define your own limit for your own product uh, in terms of uh, contamination for the ROS test, for example. So um, this is something that just maybe changed a little bit in the last years, since the magical number of 1.56 is no uh, microgram per square centimeters, sodium chloride equivalent is no longer um, accepted uh, generally. So if you have to reconsider it, I invite you to uh, check these IPC documents to um, so this uh, WP19 to check for the procedure to follow or get ideas how you can uh, define your ionic cleanliness limits before coating. Okay. Um, okay, and coming maybe to the uh, question David? regarding iodine react. Also, will iodine react with noble metal, especially gold? Uh, gold and iodine, uh, to my knowledge, will not react with iodine. You will have either the reactions possible with silver. And uh, what kind of coatings will iodine penetrate? Also, usually silicone can be, as a silicone, we can have a penetration of iodine in silicone. And the latest tests we did with Parilane uh, coating shows that we have a really good uh, protection against penetration from iodine through the Parilane layers. But uh, here uh, it can be really depending on the type of silicone and the material here you're using. But usually, yeah, we saw we, with Parilane we had really good results, uh, meaning here no problems of. Um, formation of iodine residues, or iodine metal, um, iodine um, silver uh, on pabellin um, substrates, so coated substrates. Okay, there are, I think, uh, two more questions. Yes, uh, I see the one regarding, uh, can coating defects such as the lamination or cracks be induced by improper rinse and or final rinse process in the PCA watch, which has not been detected during the ROS test? Yes, it is possible. I hear this is also true. Um, uh, proper cleaning process usually does not ha leave any residues on your assembly. Um, here, Sometimes if maybe the rinse water is too old or for other reasons, um, you may have residues after the um, after the cleaning of the assemblies. This is something that can happen. This is uh, something which is true. Uh, and of course, if you have residues remaining after cleaning, you may have problems of delamination or defects on the coating uh, afterwards. So here, the best way is to prevent this problem from happening is to monitor uh, properly the cleaning process and to uh, automatically, uh, I would say, 
analyze the assemblies after cleaning to uh, identify any problems related to the cleaning process itself. Um, to that end, I would uh, really say uh, to have an I think to maybe get into more details, participate in the webinar uh, dedicated to PCBA cleaning. My colleague will get into more details how you can monitor a process, a cleaning process to avoid this kind of problems from happening. Okay, and also regarding the questions, then I see after that on um, on on the existing no clean board. Um, yeah, it depends actually of what kind of uh, of flux you have. If it's a no clean with a full washing chemistry, um, you have to to check if the washing chemistry can remove your no clean um, no clean. Um, flux or at least no clean solder paste uh, you have combination here to check because uh, it's not uh, one size fits all in terms of cleaning you have really various chemistry available and you have to test a few of them to see which one is removing better the um, the uh, residues from the no clean assembly but i won't say you can as so with um Usually, the cleaning chemistry is developed to uh, remove no clean, uh, no clean solder paste or no clean flux on it. Uh, if you have further information regarding that, I will invite you also to check the webinar uh, next week from my colleague, Mr. Uh, Stuxner, to have more information on PCB cleaning. There is one more question about the void. Yeah, also how can I check the insible void in the conformal coating film uh, which would generate the cracks or delamination after testing? Uh, this is true. This is quite difficult to see because right after conformal coating, you think everything's okay. And after that, uh, you will notice after successive testing or test cycles that um, uh, you have apparition of defects. If these uh, defects are present from the beginning, only not visible, what you can do is use this um, either um, iodine vapor test or coating layer test, so really chemical reactions, I would say, trigger chemical reactions to identify properly the weak points or the voids that you may have in your potting material or uh, in your coating layer. So that way you can say before even testing, if your uh, coating uh, layer before testing is showing already a few uh, weaknesses that can be then translated in a formation of cracks on the lamination after testing. Okay, uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Okay, we run a little bit late uh, to the, for the webinar. Um, if you have questions, I just give you a minute to tap in. Yeah. Okay, since so we there is no further input. Okay. I think uh, uh, we will uh, close today's webinar. I would uh, thank you all for joining the session and uh, um, thank you, Freddie, uh, for the uh, sharing. And uh, we will have a, a next uh, technical sharing um, on the cleaning, as uh, Freddie just mentioned. Uh, it will be in, uh, in a week. Okay. Uh, so see you next time. And uh, if you have any further questions, you can send uh, information to, you know, question or comments to me or uh, as Freddie showed in his uh, contacts. Okay. Thank you again. Um,
have a good uh, day or good night or good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.